Yes! She did it! Mary did it! She pulled it off! There it is! It's our welcome music! And of course, it's getting the band back together. We were like, should we do something original? Should we do what should we do? That's what this live stream is all about. We're getting the band back together. We're getting this crazy group of theater makers from my world, from your world, from everybody's world, and we are getting us back together for this very beloved summer. Summer, one of my staff members who helped make that video. So big thanks to Summer. Uh, we pulled her uh, from backstage the other night to give her a hello. Uh, oh, look at this. Oh, fantastic. Well, I'm gonna tell you a little secret. A little secret. First of all, bring Mary up. Mary, come on board. Let everyone see you for a second. And let me just thank you. <laughs> How did I know? <laughs> you did a great job, Mary. Thank you for that. It was summer. Summer was great. Ah, uh, it was summer. Well, we bring summer on, but you told summer what to do. So it's all about delegation. That's all that I do. The key to my success, I just tell everyone things to do and get them to do it. Take the credit. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Go backstage now. Okay, bye. <laughs> so yeah, told me what to do again. Uh, I mean, I'm very lucky to have both summer, Mary, Monica, Ryan, Grayson, Valerie, all these incredible people on my staff in my life right now, and I'm able to keep them on. Throughout this period, thanks to the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, brought to you by the Stimulus Package. Uh, more on that later. Anyway, thank you for being here. So, if you like the theme music, if you like the welcome, I got news for you. Mary and Summer got together and they worked up a little surprise for me. That's right, we have end credit music as well with a very fun little Easter egg. So, don't sign off. Like when I'm like, okay, that's it. Don't sign up and wait till the end and watch for the Easter egg. Watch for the Easter egg at the very end of this. Okay, we have a great guest tonight. Ryan Scott Oliver is here with us. He literally was called the future of Broadway. I mean, I love that, but that's also a lot of pressure up here. We'll talk about that. A major new voice in musical theater, he was called. He has written shows like Jasper and Deadlands, uh, 35 millimeters. He's writing a movie version of Hugo right now. He's had Disney commissions. He's been produced all over the world. Um, this guy is a fantastic, fantastic, fantastic writer uh, and just a great guy. He runs a great organization as well called Actors Therapy, an educational, inspirational uh, organization to help folks like you. There it is. Look at that. ActorsTherapyNYC.com. We'll tell you all about that. Um, so we will get to that and get to Ryan in a minute. Uh, news today Drama Desk nomination came out. That's amazing. Soft power was big, right? Uh, big shout out to my to my friend just Scotland PA. Adam Blonde was nominated today. Uh, Jay Armstrong Johnson from that show. I was involved with Scotland PA, which is why I'm giving this one. A great, great show that was done at the roundabout. Um, so talks to those folks and to everyone that was nominated. It is an honor to be nominated, especially in a year like this where most four shows aren't even happening. So I'm um, Thrilled that that is happening and it's perfect. And Ramadas has always been streaming and been streaming their shows for years. So um, this is like a it'll be like old hat for them to do. So in the continuing saga of what has been cooked today, I'm gonna to show you. So I did wings, I did pancakes, I did a zucchini fritter. Today I pulled out all the stops. I pulled out all the stops and I did Oreos. This is what I cooked today. This is what I cooked, cooked today. Uh, I'm seeing some chats now that we have some sound issues. Usually, we have learned now the sound issues will resolve themselves if we just wait a moment. If we wait a moment, sounds like they may sound maybe getting better. Sound getting better. Warbly says through. This is usually just a little bit of an internet glitch because the entire Broadway industry is streaming right now. Like everybody's streaming something, which is why it's a little glitchy. Hopefully, it will clear up in just a moment. Someone give me a shout out if they're still having issues. Sound better? Sound better? 
I'm going to jump out, Mary, and jump back in. See if it clears it up. Goodbye. I'm back. Is the sound better now? I'm sorry about that, everyone. I'm hoping that that has cleared it up and that the sound is better now. Yes, the sound is better now, we're hearing. Perfect, perfect. I like that word, perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the patience there. Um, we are learning that when we have these little internet glitches, it's not us. It's StreamYard. It's all StreamYard's fault. So we jump out. We jump back in. Uh, and then we get back to it. I am uh, sorry you missed my Oreos joke, in case you missed that joke. Put up the Oreos again. This is what I cooked today. There we go. I ate half that bag. It's scrumptious, by the way, just so you know. I never go too far without them. They're right here, just in case. Having a bit of a tough day, grab an Oreo. Okay, don't forget about the Actors Fund. I think Mary put something up about the Actors Fund already. Don't forget to continue social distancing, especially if you're in Georgia, by the way. If you're in any of the states right now where they're like, hey, we're going to let people go get their hair cut or go to a bowling alley. Here's the thing. Just because someone says you can do something doesn't actually mean you have to do it. Perfect example, smoking. You actually, technically, it's okay. You are allowed to smoke. Doesn't mean you should do it. In Georgia, starting Friday, you could go bowling. Does not mean you should actually do it. So I'm saying resist. Do not, if you're in Georgia, just still stay the home. Just stay home. Help this thing out. Okay, stay safe, stay healthy, stay home. Enough of that. Let's get to our guest this evening. Please welcome to the live stream, Mr. Ryan Scott Oliver. Welcome, Ryan. Hello, how are you? I'm fantastic. How are you doing? I'm, you know, I'm living the dream in this beautiful pandemic. Uh, every day, every day is an adventure. That's how we're doing. Where are you in, in the midst of this? Uh, we, my husband and I are on the Upper East Side where we've been for 11 years. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of quiet up here. I mean, not just because like, you know, half the, half the city seems to have left, but you know, it's, it's always quiet up here. Well, there are these pockets of, like, in the Upper East Side, I'm sure being one of them, where there was an article in the Times about this, like, you know, people in wealthier sections of the city just vanished all of a sudden. Yep. Like, all these luxury buildings, yep. like, no one there. Yep. And you're yep. probably in that uh, neck of the woods, I imagine. This is definitely, I'm on 96th, right, right at the end of the queue. So, like, right when the, that queue opened, like, yeah, this whole area shifted it changed a little bit but we're we're not in one of the bougie buildings uh we we're, we're in a chill building it's a, a chilling as it were are you cooking or all ordering the time. Uh, cooking all the time non-stop truly um we are a huge fan of hello fresh which is not a sponsor of your program but like maybe they could be now mm -hmm. um and uh, also hungry root is really amazing those people who like love a good vegan dish i'm not vegan but i like for some reason love vegan food so uh, we we eat a we cook a lot, cook a ton. I'm the cook. He, my husband Matt, is the cleaning person. So did you? Where were? Did you have things going on when when this like started to happen? What what was halted as a result of this in your world? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I, I will say I got really, really, really lucky because um, I'm working on a musical version of uh, the film Hugo, um, which is that Martin Scorsese 2011 film. Uh, and we we had just done a reading uh, last July, and we were doing a workshop all through February, and uh, and you know we ended on like March first, 
And by March 2nd, start, things started getting weird. I made it home. So we got to do the whole workshop, which went very well. We had a great time. Um, and and by we, so we barely, barely made it uh, And before everything got crazy. But it got crazy literally on my husband's birthday on March 12th. That's when everything got announced. So from now on, March 12th will be a very dark day for a lot of people, <laughs> but not him. It's, it's still his birthday, still his birthday. Let's talk about Hugo for a second. So obviously a Martin Scorsese film, this is a high profile project. Yeah. So tell us a bit about the process of you being chosen for this, or I don't know if you sought yeah. it out. So just tell yep. us how that, how you became uh, the composer of it. Lyricist as yeah. well, are you doing both? Co-lyricist, co-lyricist. Co okay, yeah, tell us about that. Well, man, I'll tell you, it is a lesson in don't piss off, well, anyone, but also don't piss off like your really good friends. Um, I, every good thing that has ever happened to me has come out of what I would say is nowhere. And I remember um, J. Armstrong Johnson, who of course I've collaborated with a billion times, uh, most notably on uh, 35 millimeter. Um, and Jay and I have obviously, we're still really close friends, love Jay so much. And uh, he is really close friends with Christopher Wielden. And Christopher Wielden is the director and choreographer of Hugo. And Chris was really, you know, kind of t ripping his hair out because he was looking for somebody and, 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 and obviously coming from the ballet world, knew a lot of great composers, but not a ton of composers for the musical theater. And Jay recommended me. I met up with Chris. I wrote a spec song. Uh, I actually wrote a spec ballet to be to my own credit. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and we, the, the producers of the Hugo musical are the same producers uh, as uh, are producing uh, Anne Juliet over on the West End, uh -huh. um, Leyline Productions. And they're an incredible, incredible producing team. Anne Juliet is fantastic. Those people who got a chance to see it before everything shuttered. Um, and the process has been amazing. Um, the writing process was so fast. Like I got hired in January of 2019. We had a full draft by the summer, did a reading rewrites, workshop. I mean, it's moving really fast, which is so exciting. Cause as you know, Ken, I've been, I've been around for a little bit. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's, it's nice. It's nice that things are sort of finally coming together. It's a, it really is a dream come true. Yeah. We joked about this on uh, your podcast, but yes. it's this idea of, and I've referenced it, you're the future of Broadway, but you've been, you've been, I mean, the great news is you've been so stupid. future be able to make a living and have your shows produced yeah. all over the planet, but Broadway has still not happened yeah. yet. No, not yet. Hopefully okay. soon, sooner than later. So tell us a little bit about the, the spec song that you wrote. I mean, yeah, just, yeah. I think people don't understand the audition process sure. for musicals. Oh yeah. Did you, is one, is that song still in the show? Uh, as of the workshop, both of the, the 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 bits of spec that I wrote are still in the show, but I think they have made well, at least part of them have lived their last. So I think that we will be rewriting it. I think it's and that's mm. what's interesting. I also find on a lot of my shows, some of the first things I write that like I feel are like the heart of the show that like represent the show probably in my crazy brain because they were the first things that I wrote are almost always the most important things to cut out of the show and they take the longest time for someone to convince me to get rid of it. Hmm. So this should, this was a show that you were hired for, if you will. Yeah, yeah. So, which is different than sh a show that you feel in your gut, like, oh my God, yeah. I've got to do this, I've got to do this. Yeah. So what were you, when, when someone said, hey, what about Hugo? What about yeah. it said to you like, oh, this is, this is a show that I want to do. Like if you yeah. had stumbled on it on your own, you would have wanted yeah. to do it. Why? A hundred percent. I mean, so for one thing, like my criteria for like a good a show that I want to work on, I love to go to far off places. I think it is absolutely great to write about New York um, and to write about present day New York and, and 20 somethings, 30 somethings. So many of my peers do that so much better than me. Give that show to Drew Gasparini. I absolutely want to see that show. Mm. Um, for me, I kind of need to time travel. I kind of need to get on a plane. I need to go to another place. And I, and of course, I mean, anybody who's familiar with my work knows that I'm very attracted to darkness, but never darkness for like, cause I'm like grim. It's, it's, I'm actually very optimistic. And that's why like, I'm really attracted to people like Stephen King and, and Quentin Tarantino, people who, who use darkness as their primary 
as the as the as the daylight or the or the the light in their primary medium, but always make sure to bring us out of the tunnel and into the light with a happy ending. And I really respond to that. I guess I just I think nothing is easy, and I think that everything comes through tremendous hardship. And so Hugo, especially, it's about a little orphan boy trapped in a train station, you know, winding the clocks. And, um, you know, the greatest thing about working with Chris Wielden and Brian Selznick, who is an incredible, incredible bookmaker um, and illustrator, but he wrote Hugo, the, the, the award-winning novel, is also the book writer and the co-lyricist on this. The first thing they said to me was, we want something dark. We want this to be darker. Everything I would write, I would be told like, this is great, but can it be darker? And mm -hmm. You know, because the show is really heartwarming and it really does have a very positive message. It's got a, a nice family friendly ending, but there's a lot of darkness, man. There's a lot of darkness. And so it was perfect for me. And I, I just, I, I'm so, it's also why I think it was easy to write it so quickly. So. Right. Do you have a piano near you? I do. If only I could play it. I can be, you know, I'm only good at like plunking pitches and like stumbling through really? a room. Oh Yeah. This is something I did not know about you. This is why we do live streams. We learn about people. So you are not a pianist. Nope. My primary uh, instrument, so to speak, is voice. I, um, every, you know, I, I bear, my father was a truck driver. My mother's like an HR representative and she, I had no arts in my life. I did all the sports, even though I was terrible at them. And I didn't have music lessons like ever. And so I kind of, I, I also think like, even if I had, I just don't think I, I can't dance and I can't play the piano. My hands and my feet just, they do not, they do not belong to me. Um, but singing, you know, my my skills, and this won't surprise people from people who are familiar with my work. I'm, I'm a great orchestrator. I'm like academia, musicianship, that's where I excel. Um, and, and playing the piano just has never been. So I, for me, I always have to get a, an accompanist whenever I'm presenting work. Um, thankfully, I'm really good friends. My best friends tend to always be music directors. Yeah, um, they're smart to choose. Really them. comes in handy. So I, I use the get. You know, I use what I got. Like that's all I got. So tell us about like this is fascinating because I you know I think a lot of people. I certainly know composers that were sure, yeah. in Berlin, right? Played only yeah. black keys or whatever yeah. all those, those stories are. Mel yeah. Brook and the producers like right. recorder. Yeah. But your music is. I mean, it, it's intricate, it's complex, it's not, you know, four chords and, you know, that kind of thing. So I would have imagined that you were this virtuoso. Tell me what your, if you're to sit down and write a song right yeah. now called yeah. Live Stream, live, yeah. what would be your first, what would you do? Well, for, for me, first? For me, I mean, I'm always, I'm always looking. I, you said you, your songs aren't four chords, and I agree with you. I try to keep my stuff intricate. I try to keep my stuff complex. And if you really analyze my work, it actually is a lot, and especially my recent work, it is founded in like four chord pop progressions. But the thing that I always like to say is, I f it up, and then I dress it up. Like I won't take a chord at face value, you know, C, E, G, if you're looking at a C major chord, I'm always gonna add a weird note, a blue note, and I'm gonna make the chord progression hopefully sort of simultaneously unrecognizable so that people don't think, oh, this music is so simple, it's so simplistic, it's just four chords, but at the same time, it's listen to is that a word that we've put into the lexicon yet? It's accessible, that's, that's my approach, and I, I'm almost all of my choruses I would say dating back to 35 millimeter, I mean, almost every song in 35 millimeter is based on or inspired by a very standard pop song, like uh, The Ballad of Sarah Berry, which is one of my better known pieces. Like, I, I hate to admit it, but it's basically Lady Gaga's Bad Romance, just like <laughs> deeply messed up, just really kind of inverted and, and messed around with. Um, I, I have a song called Leave Luann, and that song is basically Jolene. And I, you know, I think where I excel is my ability to sort of, I, you know, any, all of my students uh, of writing will always say like, I'm obsessed with research. I think researching stuff is so important and you collect all these incredible ideas that excite you and inspire you. And I always know when I, when I hear something amazing and I'm like, I never would have thought of that. 
that's a damn good idea. And I collect a bunch of those ideas. Um, and that's my process. And of course, you know, you think of Sunny in the Park with George and that whole thing, you know, and uh, you know, let it come from you, then it will be new. And the idea that like, I'm never afraid of my work sounding like someone else. I'm never afraid of feeling derivative um, because I know that like my taste is always gonna be to sort of put the music and the song a little off center. And I think that, you know, I think that people who enjoy my work, I think that's what they appreciate about it. So you would, like you keep talking like, oh, the C chord, like do you compose at a piano and just plunk it out or do you compose vocally or like what's the- I will, I will play like as, as, as though I only knew how to play four chords, I can like play basic chord progressions, but like I can't keep time, like this is my left hand, I can't keep time whatsoever. And by the time, like my big process is that I put the vocal line in, I'll put the bass line in. And then, and then the neck, like the big work is fleshing out the accompaniment. And once I flesh it out, I can't play it. Like I can't even rehearse it. I can't do any, because that's, that's the big work for me. You know, that's, that's it's something that's happening on some new stuff that I'm working on right now is the exact same process. It, you know, it's just the way I work. You're even more of a genius now than I thought that when I started this, because now I know what you're doing. Speaking of 35 millimeter, uh, Summer Gro asks one of my own staffers here, some of her favorite contemporary musical theater songs of 35 millimeter. What was the inspiration for the show? Ooh, I mean, the inspiration for the show is, of course, uh, my husband, Matthew Murphy, who is a Broadway photographer, his photographs, uh, just totally, we started dating right around the time that we that we came up with writing the show together. Um, for me, I had just written a show called Mrs. Sharp and a show called Darling, and they they were you know doing well, having some heat at the time, and I was just so impatient. You know, we both know how long it takes sometimes to get a show up. Um, sometimes they never get up, uh, and I was just I my dream was to have a cast recording and a vocal selections. And I was like, 30, I, I have this idea, I'll make a song cycle or a musical exhibition based on these photographs. And then like I was saying, like every song in there sort of is a sort of send up of some other popular song. So the songs themselves are both inspired by a particular genre or contemporary sound, um, as well as Matt's photographs and of course, I was really lucky to have met Lindsay Mendez and Alex Brightman and J. Armstrong Johnson right when I was starting to write it. So I wrote the songs for them. Mm -hmm. And then along came Ben Crawford and Betsy Wolf and everything from that point was just written for them. So I had, I was so lucky to have a ton of inspiration. Um, and to any of the writers or creative people out there, you know, who are waiting for inspiration or, or especially during this pandemic and feel really stuck because they don't have the inspiration coming to them. I forget who said it. One of my favorite quotes is, inspiration is for amateurs. And that's because research, if you if you are stuck, if you aren't able to cross that, that barrier between I want to write and I am writing, that's the time you gotta go back and you gotta listen and you gotta read and you gotta watch and you have to do your research and you have to dive head first into things that feel like the thing that you wanna make. And when you're, when you're looking through 10 things, 20 things, 30 things, your brain begins, it's almost like it's a museum in your head and your brain begins to curate the, the various pieces of your display and it will always in the end sound like you and it will be created by you and it will become your vision. And that's what I would say to anybody who's struggling right now. You have the time more than ever to listen, watch and read. And that's if, if you if you wanna be creative, that's how you gotta do it. I love that. And I love this inspiration is for amateurs. One of the best uh, examples of that I've heard is uh, Seth Godin, who's a big business blogger actually. Absolutely love him. Yeah, he described uh, writer's block and he was actually refuting that such a thing exists. He was like, there's right. no such thing. It's actually bullshit. Writers are workers like anybody else. They're just mm -hmm. like a plumber. And you've never heard a plumber say, I've got plumber's block. Yes. Like, they just fucking go to work and work on the drain until they unclog it. I mean, that's what writers need to do. Just go to work like it's like you're a plumber. A hundred percent. And I would say um, Lindsay Mendez and I, you know, after 35 millimeter, we, you know, became best friends and, and we started a company called After Therapy. And our students 
I say the exact same thing to them. You know, they a lot of young actors, early career actors, they get into this business and they think like, oh my God, I'm living my dream. I'm in New York City. This is going to be so fun. I get to play act all day, you know, in, you know, eventually once I'm in the show. And it just isn't that way, especially in between the shows. You have to be a plumber and you have to you have to put in eight hours a day, whether that's working on your craft, taking class, taking lessons, working on material. That is the, how you have to fill your day. And even if you have a, you know, a 40 hour week job at the restaurant or, or wherever you're at, you still have to find that time. Mm -hmm. Every other writer, when writer, composer, that when they started, they were also starting with 40 hour a week jobs and they had to find the time, the hours, you have to find the hours. Um, somehow and it's it's very it's difficult it's really hard how are you maintaining your writing process during this time has have you changed your writing routine at all is it the same never, never. what's your what what do you what's your process yeah so well you know after you know week 1 which was oh this is fun and you know i can drink all the time and no one will no one will get mad at me and then after week two, when you're sort of like, oh, I think this is real. And then by week three, I was like, I need some project. And so I had a project in the back of my mind. Um, uh, there's this uh, uh, incredible, incredible writer named Shirley Jackson. She's long past. Um, most people would know her from The Haunting of Hill House, which was a miniseries on Netflix. Um, she also is famous for writing uh, uh, We Have Always Lived in the Castle and the short story, The Lottery. And she's got these delightful books. Uh, where are you? There you are. Um, there's the lottery. Where are you? I can do this. It's mirrored. Okay. And she has a bunch of short stories, incredible short stories. So on a whim, I was just like, you know what? I'm going to find out her people. I didn't even bother my agent yet. Um, and I reached out to them and I got the rights uh, to like five of her short stories. In the past and like couple of weeks? In the past couple of weeks, yeah. And I started, you know, I, I started working on them. I'm so excited. They're so, the other thing is they're so dark and twisted. One of them is called, one of the songs I just finished was called um, My Life with R.H. Macy. And it's basically this absurd, bizarre, dark um, uh, 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 sort of telling of a woman who gets a job at Macy's and it's like corporate on corporate on corporate. Everyone's name is like a number and nothing makes sense. And everyone's named Mrs. Cooper. It's so weird. And then there's another uh, so, uh, story, which we'll, I'm working on right now, um, called What a Thought. And it's about a woman, a housewife, all of the stories are about housewives ultimately, um, who uh, gets the idea to just kill her husband, just like over drink. She's like, I just think I wanna kill him. And she does. And in my version, it's a gay man uh, killing his husband. And it's funny, it's, you know, it's- Interesting. And perfect for a pandemic because my poor husband, like we're cooped up together. Every time we have a squabble, I'm like, it's the pandemic talking, it's not me. Um, so I'm really excited about these stories. They're, they're, you know, we're gonna write them quickly, put them out on Spotify um, with some great, great performers, you know, assuming we all can get in a room together and record. And uh, I'm, I'm so excited. I, I just have to have something to work on. I love this story so much because here you are, a guy, you've won like every major writing award there is. You've got a Martin Scorsese movie title that you're adapting that has producers on board. You're doing all that stuff. And you're like, I'm going to go get the rights to this myself during the pandemic. You're just like Googling the names of the agents or the reps. It's just like, I just love it. You were just taking your career into your own hands. It's That's what you need to do in this business, I assume, that you preach to all your students. I do, but you know what? I, I was talking with Brian Selznick, who wrote the book of Hugo, and I, I, was, I said to him, I was like, you know, how, what are you doing to stay productive? Because, you know, this man has done a million and a half things, and, and he do, he's the least person who needs to be productive. But among my students, the word, the idea of being productive has, I think, become a sort of controversial idea. And, I, and, I, and I'm sensitive to that. And I know that the mm -hmm. answer for everybody is not necessarily be productive. And, but for me and for people like me, I, I, I guess that's maybe type A personalities, I don't know. I don't feel like myself if I'm not creating something. And I think, and I, so, so to anyone watching, listening that is, doesn't feel like themselves, you know, the answer in some cases is to find a long form project, whether that's a puzzle mm -hmm. or 
or it's a musical or a play, chipping away at that a little bit every day can be the thing that brings you back to the only thing you have control of, which is feeling as much like yourself as you possibly can be. But again, that's not for everybody. I know, I know a lot of people just needed a long break and here we are in our very long break. I also love that you're gonna write this stuff and then you're gonna immediately put it out on Spotify. Yeah. It's like not, you're not like, oh, and then I'm gonna to try to do a reading and then we'll see what happens. You're like just spitting your music out there in the world as fast as you can make it. You know, and here's the thing is that like, and you know this better than anybody, you know, as a creative, as a producer on all sides of the table, we, we can, when someone creates something, an audience can make it better every day until forever, right? Everyone's always gonna have an idea of how this thing could be better and different. And I love, you know, working on Hugo, obviously, like I am here for those notes and I'm so excited to make the piece better little bit by little bit. But every now and again, you know, a show like 35 millimeter is an example of this. And this, these Shirley Jackson stories, sometimes it feels good to be a creative person and you know, do your homework and make sure that what you're putting out there is of quality and something you stand behind and play it for your spouse and your friends and, and, and your loved ones and make sure that they've given the sign off. But at some point you just wanna put it out there. I wrote a song in 35 millimeter called, um, oh my God, oh, why must we tell them why? And that came from a director who was asking me, you know, when you write, when, we, when we're showing this show to people, um, we should tell them why they're here. And I was just like, you know what? Sometimes it is what it is. And like, and it's not, sometimes the first raw draft, raw, and that's the key word. There's something still to be mined for the audience that the rawness of it is what makes it special as opposed to the perfected 26th draft that has mm -hmm. so many other visions on top of it that it makes the piece great but still kind of blurry. And I think there's room for both kinds of, of creative work. That's what I think. I love that. In fact, I'm gonna give you an example that I believe that rent is so effective and so emotional because it is raw and yep. unfinished. Yeah, for like, sure. Well, you know, it's such a tragedy that Jonathan passed away before yeah. you could see that, but he didn't get to smooth out the edges which are all the characters and that story is so rough around the edges that I think it lends itself to it. And if you analyze it like it's Shakespeare or a completely polished piece of work, you'll find all these flaws, but that's what makes it beautiful. Absolutely, absolutely. It's so true, it's so true. Well, listen, thank you so much for all this. Is incredible. Are you, do, you do actor therapy, is, you have writer therapy? I feel like you should have that class. Where's that? Well, we actually, what we actually started is a class called Independent Study, and it basically has become writer therapy. I have a great group of of, of folks who um, we're working together uh, uh, every week, and yeah, actor therapy. We we've, we've uh, just before everything sort of uh, closed down, Lindsay was like, "We got to get online," and so we started actor therapy online, and I'm so relieved. Um, yeah. I'm so relieved uh, that so many students have, have gotten excited about it. And um, I was nervous that the online format would sort of kill the magic of what we're doing. And I gotta say, it's not been the case. Um, so much of what we do still translates so beautifully. And it's also been a blessing to have Lindsay back because obviously Lindsay is on All Rise on CBS. We're very excited for her about that. But it's not. it's been nice to have her back. You know, she's she's such a great, she's such a brilliant teacher. She really, really, really is. Um, and so she's been, you know, 24 seven with me. I mean, we teach basically every single night. I mean, it's nonstop. Awesome. It's just yeah. awesome. Well, thank you for your commitment to all those people out there uh, in the world. Oh, look, Zedro Rodriguez says, this is deep. We'll have to share with all theater teacher groups. Please do share, share Ryan's right. words. Go see actortherapynyc.com. Check it out and join. Thank you so much for being here. Good luck with the new show you just like <laughs> optioned and will have done probably by this is done. It's awesome. Thanks, Ken. Thank you so much. Take care, my friend. Bye. Look, Mary Steffens right there. I think she took the words right out of my mouth with her comment. OMG, Ken, I've enjoyed all your interviews, but this one was the best. Thank you and thanks to Ryan. He's a very inspirational guy. Very talented guy. Go, it's ryanscottoliver.com, I believe, if we haven't thrown up his web address. 
go listen to his music. Darling, by the way, which is one of the shows that really uh, pops him on the scenes with some fantastic tunes. Jasper Deadland's amazing. Um, you will. He is, hasn't been there yet, but you will see a show of his on Broadway for sure. Maybe it'll be Hugo, and you'll be able to say, I heard about that then. Uh, thanks for being here tomorrow. We have Jen Colella on the live stream. Jen Colella, star of Come From Away, Urban Cowboy. Remember that one? Uh, also, High Fidelity, fantastic talent and super lady as well. I'm very inspiring. You're going to love hanging out with her for 30 minutes. Uh, what else do we have to tell you about? Don't forget about the Actress Fund. Don't forget to stay safe, stay healthy, stay home. Oh, by the way, speaking of um, sharing this with people, don't forget that if you jo are joining us for your first interview, this is number 30. We've already, God help us. We have already done 30 of these live streams. Look at all the people that we've had on board. 30 so far and at least 30 more to come. If you missed any of these, you can catch a replay. Mary's going to throw it into the comments or just go to my Facebook page, hit the, hit the videos button. You'll see them all there. It's amazing to actually watch a few and see the trends and the themes. So go check it out. And please do share, share, share. People can still donate after it has been live. And we really want to get up that, that, that number up for the Actors Fund. So share, 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 share. Theater teachers, educators, whoever you think will, be, uh, will value this stuff. So check it out. Something to make you smile this week is very special. One of the first things I did when this pandemic hit, and I was like, I got to – I got to give something for all the theater makers out there to do was the rave theater festival, which is a theater festival that I founded last year that cross your fingers is hopefully going to be still on this year. Just maybe moved a little bit later. I don't know if July is going to work out, but we're trying to find a new date uh, when we get the all clear a little bit later. So we rave theater festival sponsored the first social distancing festival and we announced our winner. What did the person win? They like we came up with some fun stuff: Uber Eats, Netflix, a year's supply of toilet paper, like all sorts of fun stuff. The goal was to write a song, monologue, something about with social distancing and shoot it with someone else, if you want. But no, uh, you couldn't be in the same room; you had to be alone. So you could use twenty people if you wanted. But anyway, the winner is this um, today's, not this week's, tonight's. Something to make you smile. David and Paul Regano with sc screen to screen, screen to screen. They're our big winners of all that stuff. We also gave them a copy of War and Peace. You know, we had fun. Uh, so go to producersperspective.com backslash smile to see screen to screen and drive up their views some more. That's how they won. The person with the most views won. Uh, and these guys, brothers, they are, won the big contest. So congratulations to those. And now it's the Easter egg you've been waiting for. You saw our welcome credits. Here come the goodbye credits. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. Wait for the Easter egg at the very end. Bye.